Thank you, Robin. Good afternoon, everyone. It has been such an exciting day today. Um, let's, let's hear a round of applause. Did you enjoy the industry roundtables this afternoon? Again, thank you to all of our uh, individuals that uh, participated in hosting the tables. And I, I, I guess I should just start by saying, uh, as um, a neighbor here in the Triangle, um, Lenovo has been very excited and proud to be part of this conference for the past several years. It is always a tremendous uh, benefit to have an opportunity to meet with educators and to exchange ideas and get feedback on how we as a technology company and, and our peer companies uh, around the area and around the state can help to raise uh, student achievement and uh, teacher success in North Carolina. If you aren't familiar with Lenovo, we are the number one PC company in the world. We have one of our two global headquarters just up the road in Morrisville with about 2,200 employees. We also have a manufacturing facility in, in Guilford County uh, in Whitsitt, just near Greensboro, uh, with a couple hundred more employees there. So we're very proud to be a uh, North Carolina, uh, called North Carolina home, and also, again, be part of this uh, event this afternoon. STEM is, as you can understand, very important to a company like Lenovo. Um, knowing that all of you are making a difference in helping generate our next generation of innovators means a whole lot to us. We thank you, uh, each and every one of you, for what you do every day in your day jobs to help, again, student achievement and student success across the state. So I know you're not here to, to, uh, to hear from me. I am very pleased and proud to be able to announce uh, your next item on the agenda, which is our speaker, Sajan George. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of background on Sajan. As founder and chief executive officer, Sajan leads Matchburg Learning, a national nonprofit school management organization launched in 2011 to turn around our nation's bottom 5% of underperforming public schools with a unique blended model of school that leverages both online technology and turnaround management skills. Matchbook Learning has launched three successful school turnarounds in Detroit and has plans to expand nationally. Prior to founding Matchbook Learning, CEO Sajan George was a managing director with Alvarez and Marcel a and where he led the firm's education practice. In that role, he led a diverse group of talented turnaround professionals across the U.S. in running entire K-12 public school systems and districts. Sajan will speak about his personal experience of designing future school models. So please help me give a round, a round of applause for Sajan George. Good afternoon. Well, it's great to be here. I don't know if it's great to uh, speak at the end of a conference after a two-hour lunch and an incredibly decadent kind of dessert that's cake on a popsicle stick or whatever they call it. So if any of you are feeling that sort of afternoon sleep coma, feel free to use one of the chairs for a few minutes while I talk. Um, I actually owe a debt of gratitude to the state of North Carolina. Uh, uh, my parents uh, were born and raised in India, and they emigrated here to the U.S. based on the generosity uh, and kindness of a North Carolina woman. She wanted to sponsor someone in India that would come here to study higher ed. My dad was one of eight kids. There's no way his father would be able to afford to send him to college. He stuck his hand up, never meeting the woman, she never meeting him. He came here, she embraced him, and he did his undergrad at uh, Elon College, which I now know is Elon University. He went up north for his master's, but loved the south, and he, he, uh, he did his uh, PhD at uh, UNC. The, my parents eventually settled and still live in Canada, but last summer, I was able to bring them with my kids, their grandkids, back to the state after 50 plus years so they could go through their old stomping ground. So thanks for having me. I, I owe you a debt of gratitude. So um, what I want to talk about today is uh, redesigning education. And specifically, I know that uh, Todd and Brian did a great job yesterday sort of talking about future trends that are driving, uh, trends that are driving the future of learning. And um, with the implications of districts and schools and how design thinking could play a part and a role in what, in, on, around those trends. So they took this sort of macro view and then funneled it down into education. I want to do the reverse today. I want to start with an education and then take a macro view going back up. So they went top to, to bottom. I want to go bottom to top, if you will. And as we think about 
design thinking and redesigning education, I want to frame the next 30 minutes around these key areas. Why redesign public education? What are we re redesigning it to? How do we redesign? Where should we consider implementing that redesign? And then lastly, I'll, I'll share with you a little bit of our results, matchbook learning, and implementing a blended model in some of the worst performing public schools in America. So let's start with the first one, why re redesign. If I had to give you guys a single picture, a single image of all that is wrong in public education today, it would be the following image. The picture on the left is a 1914 classroom. The picture on the right is a 2014 classroom. Side by side, there's a hundred year difference between these two pictures, and yet very little else differs. In both pictures, kids are sitting in rows. They move through a printed curriculum. A teacher stands in front of them and moves them through that curriculum at largely the same pace, sequence, and learning style for each kid. I dare you to find another industry in America that has changed so little in the delivery of its product or service in the last 100 years. And what has that lack of redesign gotten us? Well, if I was to go to any zip code in America that was in the bottom 25% income-wise, and I started with 100 kids at birth, and just followed those kids through elementary, middle, and high school, 71 of them, statistically speaking, would graduate high school. 41 of them would then go on to actually attempt college and only nine of them would graduate with a college degree. If you're born in the bottom 25% zip code, income-wise, your chances of success today in America are at 9%. This is why we have to redesign public education. But what do we redesign to? So on one hand, you come to a conference like this and you get inoculated with this design thinking that you start with a blank sheet of paper, right? Blue sky. Just innovate, iterate, prototype, right? And then you go back, you leave this conference, you go back to your school, and you go back to your, your building, and you realize, I'm gonna re-envision this place. And the problem with that is, it's not a blank sheet of paper. Because inside those walls are actual kids with hopes and dreams, but real fears and challenges and obstacles. And so maybe we can't sort of prototype from a blank sheet of paper. So then we think, well, wait a minute. What we should do, what a good design thinker, we'd, we'd reverse engineer this. Understanding by design. Start with the end outcome in mind. Figure out what your assessments are. Design your learning experiences. Reverse engineer where you want to go. And the problem with that is, how do you reverse engineer when you don't know what that end destination is? So in public education, we talk about college and career readiness, right? We want our kids to be college and career ready. We want to graduate high school college and career ready. Clayton Christensen, many of you know, author, Harvard Business Professor, says um, his disruption innovation theory predicts that somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of the higher ed institutions today within 10 years will be completely out of business. There's a recent article uh, in the New York Times how technology is uh, ruining the middle class. That there's entire, so there's, in this new economy, we're four, three to four years post the deepest part of the recession, and yet there's a swath of jobs that have simply left and are not coming back. There are jobs on the high end, white collar jobs, architects, lawyers, doctors, they still remain. There's jobs at the very low end that you can't seem to outsource, like x-ray technicians or the person that cuts your hair, but there's a whole middle category that are completely gone. So what does college and career readiness mean today when half the colleges we're preparing for them won't exist? and more than half the, co the careers we're preparing for them won't exist. We need a new lens in which to redesign public education. And I want to talk to you about how you think about redesigning education with these two lenses. Sustainable and scalable. The truth of the matter is we have sustainable models of education today. You don't need to come to a conference like this to know that. There are many high-performing schools. There's high-performing charter schools, high-performing traditional schools, and if you look at them, they've, they've remained high performing for many, many years. The problem with these sustainable models is they don't scale very well. A high performing school doesn't lead to a high performing district. High performing charters don't scale well across the country. On the flip side, on the scalability lens, we have stuff that can scale. Many of you are in districts that do scaling initiatives, right? 
Look at what's happening around the country. You can't, you can't but look at the news today and find another district that's in initiating and rolling out some sort of one-to-one -one initiative. District decides we're gonna give tablets to every middle school kid or every high school kid. And boom, it happens citywide. Thousands of kids get it, literally in a matter of weeks. The problem with those scaling efforts is they're difficult to sustain. What happens when there's an election cycle? What happens when there's a budget cut at a state or district level? What happens when there's a turnover in the superintendent? The average superintendent, urban superintendent in America, lasts just 2.2 years in their job. The truth is, when you think about redesigning education, we're going to have to think about the intersection between sustainability and scalability. You have to design things that both can sustain and scale, because the need in our country is that great. How do we redesign? I'm going to argue that we need a, an ecosystem view. There's a book I read recently by author Ron Adner uh, called A New Strategy for Innovation, the, A Wide Lens. And what the author Adner argues is that if you're going to disrupt an industry, there's actually three risks that you have to account for and try and mitigate. We all think about execution risk, which is how do I get my idea to the market on time, on budget. But Adner makes the point there's actually two other risks you have to account for, adoption risk and co-innovation risk. Let me explain. Adoption risk is the risk that you get your product or your idea or your solution to the marketplace and the people don't adopt it. The end user doesn't adopt it. How many people here uh, are familiar with Segway, right? Do you remember um, probably the 12 months before Segway launched? All this hype, right? It was this sort of black box technology product. Nobody knew exactly what it was. It was this build up. It was going to be, it was elusive and mysterious, but it was, all you knew that it was going to completely change the way we live, work, and play. The truth of the matter is, Segway produced the product that they thought they, that they had designed to do. It works exactly the way that they had forecast but it didn't actually disrupt the way we live, work, or play. Unless you're a mall or airport cop, it really hasn't changed our lives. <laughs> they didn't account for the adoption risk in what they were designing. The good news is, when we're, as we're talking about technology, we're talking about STEM, we're talking about um, these, these trends and drives of technology, the adoption risk for technology-enabled learning, student-centered learning in a STEM environment is coming way down. Those of you who have young kids, you can't put a tablet in a two or three year old's hands without them figuring out how to do it. It's, it's just that simple. My kids, know, when they were that age, they could, figure, they could take out my smartphone. I don't know how, but they always figured out how to dial 911. <laughs> the adoption risk in education as it relates to technology is coming way down. That's good news. Second risk we have to account for is co-innovation risk. So this is the risk that when you bring your product or idea or solution, what other parts of the value chain also have to innovate and come to market? What else are you dependent on? So when HDTVs came out a decade ago, and you went into stores like Best Buy and you saw them, they were amazing. That The picture quality was incredible. It was crisp. You could see this like little bumblebee going onto a flower, and just the close-up imagery was powerful. But if you look at the growth in their sales, it was very flat for a very long time. And the reason because there was the co-innovation risk was very high. There was no HD TV programming that you could watch on these TVs. Your favorite cable channels were not filming in HD, so you had a TV but no programming. There was high co-innovation risk. So when the product was launched, it actually wasn't sequenced well. In public education, we think about co-innovation risk, particularly as you think about personalized learning. There's a number of risks we currently have today. We need learning management systems that integrate content well. So we don't have to go to multiple screens and multiple logins and multiple reports to get a composite picture of a student. We need online content that has rigor and relevance, but also recommendation capability. And we need assessments that are performance-based, that don't just ass that assess mastery on deeper and higher learning. Here, too, the co-innovation risk is coming down. Not as perhaps as rapidly as adoption risk. We're living through a major pivot. But as every day as new apps, new technologies, new content providers, new interactive games come on, the co-innovation risk comes down. So that brings us to execution risk, the last risk. So this is, this is the one we own, right? 
And what I'm trying to tell you here is don't think of your journey as a single person running a solo marathon. You have to have an ecosystem view and understand these other risks if what you're designing and developing is actually going to work. So the question is, what should we be executing on? If we're redesigning education, what is our role in the ecosystem? I was at a conference recently, um, it was in Atlanta, and they had a panel of CEOs, Fortune 1000 CEOs, and it was a really great uh, sort of lively debate conversation back and forth. Really rich, really robust. And the entire panel and conversation came to a complete stop when the moderator asked the following question. The moderator turned to the panel and said, um, CEOs, uh, what, would, what advice would you give K-12? I mean, they're the producers of your future workforce. What counsel would you give them? Pin drop silence. It was incredibly awkward for like a really long time. Finally, after a long pause, one of the CEOs said, well, you know, it used to be that we hired for competence. We'd write a job description, and then we'd interview people, and we'd look at their resume and their experience, and if they had the skills to do the job, if they were competent, we'd hire them. He said, we still do that. We still hire for competence. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. He said, today we have to hire for capacity. As soon as he says that, another CEO, woman next to him says, you know, you're exactly right. Whatever job we're hiring our people for today, all I know is in 18 months, they'll be doing something different. It won't be the job that we hired them for. And so, um, and then someone else says, that's exactly right. We, um, when we give assignments, particularly to our young employees, um, and they're usually project-based, we say, here's a project, we need you to do it by X date. And the project, say, has three tasks or subtasks in it. If they come back by that date and do those three tasks with excellence, that's not enough. We need them to do those three tasks with excellence. But we need them to come back to us and say, I did those three things that you asked me, and there's two things you didn't ask me, but I went and did them because they're important and here's why. And so they were all kind of, the CEOs were saying it slightly differently, but they were saying the same thing. The person that captures it best is Wayne Gretzky. So for those of you that are not hockey fans, um, I did say I grew up in Canada. Uh, Wayne Gretzky uh, is the greatest hockey player of all time, nicknamed the great one and uh, scored more goals, more points, more assists than any other professional hockey player ever. They once asked him, Gretzky, how, do you, how come you score so many more points than anybody else? He said, everybody skates to where the puck is. I skate to where the puck is going to be. I think in public education right now, our preoccupation with standardized tests value-added growth measures, international tests, PISA, is skating to where the puck is. Don't get me wrong, they're necessary. We still have to perform in those. It is no longer sufficient. What those CEOs were saying is that there is in the 21st century a new set of skills that we demand that public education currently is not preparing our students for. We need we need a workforce that doesn't just solve the problem, but actually generates multiple solutions to the problem. Think how absurd it would be if you went to work for an employer in an industry, and the employer said, here's a project, and I want you to do it. I don't want you to talk to anybody else. I don't want you to ask anybody else. I don't want you to look at anybody else. I just want you to do it by yourself. It would be absurd. And yet, how much of that is our students' experience today? What do you do when you don't know what to do? And the last is we need, we need our students to communicate, not just with completeness and accuracy, but with delight and wonder. So at Matchbook Learning, to curate an environment that, that drives these sorts of 21st century skills, we've created in our school student-centered classrooms. This is a picture of one of them. So our students, at the very beginning of the year, take an assessment. It's an adaptive assessment. And they get leveled. 
So instead of a K to eight school, we have levels one through 19, or 18. And they could be a level five in English language arts, and a level nine in math, and a level four in science, and that's okay. And their subject area, they're leveled by their group into small groups. And in those small groups, they go through a learning continuum. On the edges of the classroom are evidence, evidence of their student work product. I go into many classrooms around the country. I'm always amazed. I walk in the class, I'm looking at the walls, and I see tons of evidence of teacher work product. Here's the teacher's word wall. Here's the teacher's vision. Here's the teacher's model. Here's the teacher's goals. Where's the evidence of the student work product? I know teachers know what the students need to know and by when, but do the students know? So we visually display what the learning targets are and where each student is relative to their learning targets. There's a shared vision that they design and develop. There's a parking lot for questions that they have that the teacher may not be able to get to right away, but will get to before the end of the day. And then lastly, there's common language. In education, we use these terms, mastery and proficient, competent, not competent. What does that mean to a third grader? So we, we come up with common language, first base versus third base. So when they're struggling or they're mastering, they have language they can use that they can identify, their peers can identify, and the teacher can understand where they are. Each of the students, once they're leveled, in their small groups, they go through a continuum of learn, practice, apply, and assess. So we curate, with the teachers, options. So they have different options on how they might learn how to add fractions, four or five different ways they can learn it. Could be direct instruction in a small group with a teacher. It could be uh, an online video. And the point is, the teacher curates the options, but the students choose. They choose which options they want. Once they learn it, then they practice it. Again, it could be a pencil and paper assignment. It could be a manipulative. It could be an interactive game. Once they practice it, then they apply what they've learned. They have to, there's three projects they have to do, three pieces of evidence. This is what's going up on the walls. And their pieces of evidence has to demonstrate mastery. They have to score at least a three out of four on a rubric. If they realize they can't, they're not, they're not mastering, they're not being able to apply it, they go back through that learn, practice, apply, so that they have ownership over their own learning. And lastly, they get an assessment that, that updates their learning path. And in that assessment, we start using design thinking to push the projects and the type of assessments these kids will get. We want them to go through a process where they're investigating, ideating, creating a prototype, getting feedback, and improving on that prototype as evidence or mastery of what they've learned. So if they're, if they're in an English language lesson and they're, and they're, they're, they're learning uh, synonyms and hononyms, they write, they write an entire poem with synonyms in it. And they share that poem. Once we've curated that design, once we've created a, a classroom environment that has these design elements in it to drive those 21st century skills, then I want to come back to this question. So what's our role in the ecosystem? What are we to do as designers in education? The technology is going to continue to advance. There's going to be every day new apps, new content, new assessments. And every day that there's new technology innovations, there's also going to be adopters for those technologies. We can't stop this train. Districts, schools, teachers, parents, they're going to continue to adopt the technologies out there. I think our role, our role as educators, with inside the system of education, is to ensure that the human capital innovates as rapidly and as well as the technology does. And what that means for us at Matchbook, when we think about innovating on the human capital side, how do we help those teachers? How do we recruit, select, develop, manage, and ultimately platform those teachers and these kind of models. And my, my advice is this, if we don't do this, if the human capital innovation doesn't happen as rapidly as the technology innovation, if it doesn't keep pace, we're gonna get some weird automations of public education. Some of these blended models in the country, go, 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 go see them. They've torn down walls, they're innovative, and you walk in and you feel like you're at a call center. Just rows and rows of kids in cubicles with headphones sitting in front of a computer while the computer does all the instruction. I fundamentally think that we can do a better job on the human capital piece than that. It starts with recruiting. So at Matchbook, we designed, we created this database through social media of about 5,000 educator resumes. And what we do is we're constantly messaging on our model, the design parameters of our model. 
expressing the qualities or characteristics or attributes of our blended model that make it unique. Whatever your design, whatever you're, whatever you're dreaming, you're going to have to recruit people to participate in your solution. And the way that you recruit them is talk about what is distinctive about what you're designing. These are our five elements, but yours may be different. Once we've recruited them, then we, how do we select them? How do we select from this pipeline of teachers who would be effective in our blended classrooms? I call it finding Bruce Waynes. Bruce Waynes, those of you kids know, he's the alter ego of, of uh, Batman. And the reason I use that example is because Bruce Wayne is actually the only superhero who doesn't have any superpowers. Can't fly, can't run fast, can't jump high, isn't bulletproof. But he has a pretty cool suit and a pretty cool utility belt that when he wears that, he can do ex superhuman things. Our job, I think, is to take ordinary teachers and make them extraordinary. What we found is that there's at least three qualities. Again, this is for our model, maybe different for what you're designing or thinking. But for us, our teachers require at least three qualities, grit, innovation, and transparency. Grit because the transition from a traditional method of teaching to a blended student-centered environment requires perseverance. Those first few months are hard. Kids at different levels, taking assessments at different times, moving at different paces. But there's a level of grit that's required. Innovation because we actually don't know what works. I don't know how every kid is going to learn phonics. But we're going to look at the data, we're going to try, and we're going to, and so sometimes we have to help break down teachers. I got this really great lesson that's going to work, and I'm going to teach them. I said, great, let's try it. And I go, and then look at the data and say, it worked for about 30% of the class. It was a great lesson for 30% of the class based on the data. Well, what do I, what do, I do next? What do you want to try? They have to have that, that level of innovation. And then lastly, transparency. When you're looking at data, particularly in a blended environment where the data is coming at you daily, there's a level of transparency both in the data and the performance. And you have to have candid conversations of what's happening in the classroom. People have to ha be willing to be transparent around their actual practice, which let's face it, for a lot of teachers, that's unusual. They're used to sort of closing the door and doing their thing and then going home at the end of the day. Having this level of scrutiny requires a level of transparency. Once we select the teachers, then it's our job to develop them. My big criticism of a lot of blended models is most of the teacher training is around the technology. How to use the technology, what are the features of the technology, how to run a report in the technology, how to group students in the technology. There's very little development on how to actually personalize instruction in order to personalize learning for students. Our experience is if we want students to experience personalized learning, then we need teachers to experience that in the way that they're developed. So we move kids, sorry for the, the dark screens there. Um, we move kids from, uh, sorry, teachers from far left to far right, practicing to developing to accomplishing against a set of criteria that we've established rubrics on. And the way we develop them that is we, we give every teacher in our school 40 observations a year. We capture it on an online app against those rubrics. So every few days, we're giving them an observation. Every two weeks, on another app that we've created, we coach, one-on-one, -on -one, each teacher. We have a coaching session where we're triaging the student data that we're getting from the platform, our own observations, and their own impressions of what they're seeing. What this begins us is we begin to see trends. We begin to see which of our coaching strategies are working well with which teachers, which of their methodologies are working well with their classrooms. We compare that to themselves and their own growth, to their peers, to the school, and what we're doing is we're touching and engaging teachers probably 70, 80 times a year. You would have to be a professional athlete or a Hollywood actor or actress to get that kind of coaching in your career, but that's where we need to take the profession of teaching to. Once we're developing them, now we're, now we're starting to explore how do we manage them better. What we're finding is by having teachers work together in cohorts during a common prep period, you can have a master teacher paired with a, a rookie TFA teacher with a mid-level teacher. And the three of them can collaborate together on creating and curating the, the content and the playlist that happen in that learn, practice, apply, assess, continuum I talked about. And so you're leveraging the, um, the master teacher's expertise, content expertise, over instead of 30 students or 25 students, maybe 80. You're leveraging maybe the junior teacher's technology uh, and, and ability to find resources online. And then you're probably leveraging the mid-level teacher's relational prowess. 
Each teacher brings different strengths, but the point is by having them collaborate and giving them slightly different roles within that collaboration, more students benefit. And then lastly, we need to, we need to platform. We need to share their stories, the stories of our students and our teachers to a wider audience. Not just in the schools that we're, we're now redesigning and the schools we're turning around, but to much a wider audience. It's part of the reason why I'm here. So where do we redesign? Okay, so I get it. You kind of walk through, we, we understand this design thinking. Where should we redesign? And I would argue you've got to find space where you can do two things. You've got to find space where you can risk. This is hard because as what you've heard and seen, innovation requires failure. But education is not an industry that's receptive to failure or risk. So you've got to be able to find space you can risk. You can try something new. But I would also say you've also got to find space where you can scale. Because if you're successful, you're going to want to scale. Because again, the need in this country, in this state, is huge. It's massive. So find the intersection for where you can both risk and scale. For matchbook learning, it, was bottom it is bottom 5% schools. Every state is required by law every year to, to identify at least their worst bottom 5% performing schools. Every year there's a new list that comes out, but they have to identify that. That's a good opportunity for us to try an innovative blended approach. Because the status quo is so fundamentally broken that they're receptive to us trying something new. But it's also space we can scale because the number of chronically failing schools is massive and growing. Particularly with the advent of common core uh, assessments, the bar is getting higher and the number of failing schools is increasing, sadly. So what are our results? Uh, what have we learned, what have we done, matchbook learning, and this redesign? So three years ago I launched, we're a nonprofit, and we launched our first blended school turnaround, AL Holmes Elementary. It was a K-8 school, I call this Prototype 1. And if you think you've got constraints, listen to the constraints that we accepted in implementing our blended model in this bottom 5% school. We worked with the existing principal. We worked with the existing staff. It was a heavily unionized environment. We agreed and they agreed that we would implement our blended model using the same staff, same building, same policies, same everything that enabled it to be bottom 5%. Now why would we accept those kinds of constraints? Candidly, we needed an early adopter. We needed to prototype something and to try it and to learn from it. In just two years, we doubled the percentage of kids proficient in reading and quintupled the percentage of kids proficient in math on the SAID exam. The rising second graders, who had now only known a blended model of school in their young lives, were testing at 67% proficient in reading, 35% in math. Ale Holmes this past summer was rewarded uh, reward school status by the Michigan Department of Ed. That status is given to schools either in the top 5% or have a trajectory like one. We prototyped again. A year and a half ago, we launched our second blended model prototype. This is also a bottom 5% school, K-8 to in Detroit part of the Education Achievement Authority. We prototyped, this time we wanted to use a competency-based system. In that first one, we had to meet kids at their grade level and move them through the grade level content and still take the grade level state assessment at the end of the year. In this model, we could use a competency-based model. We could meet kids actually where they were academically and then progress them from there. When we started um, at the beginning of 2012, only seven out of 832 kids were proficient in either reading or math on the state exam. Not 7%, seven percent, seven kids. In just one year, our first full year, almost 70% of the kids are making multiple years worth of growth in a single year. This school, Brenda Scott, had the fifth highest student achievement gains across the entire city, including all performing magnets, charters. The fifth highest, same kids, just different model. Third prototype we launched last year, last September, Burns Elementary. Um, in many ways, uh, this was our greatest challenge and greatest opportunity. Burns, over a four-year period, was ranked dead last. It was ranked 2,362 out of 2,362 school, schools in the state of Michigan. The very worst school. And yet, I feel like this represents our greatest opportunity because it's our third prototype. So we keep iterating and we keep learning. It was just named about... Uh, two months ago in Education Week as one of eight uh, elementary middle schools worth seeing in the country. I can keep giving you statistics like this, but I want to come back to why redesign. Why redesign public education? I think we redesign it for students like Deanna Reed. 
She was our highest point gainer last year in English language arts. She had a, so one of the things we look at is their adaptive assessment at the beginning of the year and at the end of the school year and the difference between those two. It gives us a sense of their growth over the year. And she had an 879 point gain between those two points. So I went back to the uh, assessment company that did the adaptive assessments and I said, hey, help me interpret her results. And they came back and they said, I don't know if we can. I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, normally, so she's 13, so someone her age, a performing student, a year's worth of growth, should be, for a performing student, 158 points. Deanna crushed that. You see, she was physically in the eighth grade, but she was probably reading at the beginning of the year at a first or second grade level. Now, if we had started our eighth grade curriculum and moved her along and make her take the eighth grade test, we totally would have missed it. But if you think about it, <laughs> she's socializing with eighth grade peers, even though she's reading at a first grade level. That's remarkable. That's remarkably intelligent. And when we begin to tap into that remarkable intelligence by meeting where she is, she not only closes the gap, she actually begins to accelerate beyond her peers because she has a level of grit and determination that I would kill for my kids to have. When we redesign public education, we think about design thinking and getting the right design, which is important, that middle circle. But the truth is, we have to think about the adoption risk and what conditions are necessary for, the, for their for idea to be adopted. The design of our solution, including the interdependencies we have with other innovators. And then what do we execute on, particularly on the human capital piece? But if we think about that, we can actually redesign public education and move it from not from being impossible to just possible but possible to probable. And we have to, because the kids we serve depend on us. Each and every one of them has a dream of what they want to be when they grow up. And when we help them realize their dreams, these kids will help us realize ours as a nation. Thank you. So I think uh, Angela Quick and Sam Houston are going to come up, and we're probably going to have some questions.